Basic Brewing Radio is sponsored in part by the American Homebrewers Association. Up your IPA game with homebrewing techniques, craft beer clone recipes, and a free book from the American Homebrewers Association. Push your brews to the limits with Brewing Eclectic IPA by Dick Cantwell. Or dive into science and history with IPA, brewing techniques, recipes, and the evolution of India Pale Ale by Mitch Steele. Join for one year and receive your choice from 60 different brewing books. Visit homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing for offer details. That's homebrewersassociation.org slash basicbrewing. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, June 1st, 2023. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin joins me to formulate a cold IPA recipe. What's a cold IPA? I'm not sure, really, still. <laughs> but it's Matt's turn to brew, and he puts together a very citra-forward, tasty-sounding brew, no matter what you call it. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks to everybody who has helped out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. We're heading into June, and that means homebrew con. Thanks to the support of our Patreon folks and uh, our sponsors, of course. Steve and I will be heading to San Diego in a few weeks to take part in that. Uh, we'll take that week off from posting the podcast but I hope that we'll be gathering a lot of fun stuff for the show to bring back home. Uh, we're both very excited. We've got one more show from our trip to Chicago. Uh, we recorded interviews at the Ballpark Brewfest in Schaumburg, Illinois. That was a lot of fun. Uh, but I wanted to squeeze in the conversation with Matt this week about the cold IPA to kind of break things up a little bit. It's, it, it's nice to have multiple episodes recorded and in the can. It's kind of a luxury uh, I also have part three of that mead tasting that Steve and I did with Tim Lieber a while back. That was maybe too much fun. <laughs> but I think I, I think I edited it enough. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of mead in June, you know what happens in that month? Father's Day. Forget a necktie or soap on a rope. Remember that? Get that a Father's Day gift box from our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly from Groenfell and Havoc Meaderies in Vermont. Uh, there's the one Father's Day gift box featuring braggy, black currant strong mead and old fashioned mead, which is a mead that's inspired by the old fashioned cocktail. Yum. Or the Crafty Dad Father's Day gift box that features SEMA Spring Celebration Limited Craft Mead, Draki. Black Currant Craft Mead, Buckland Spring and Summer Seasonal Mead, and Old Wayfarer Oaked Amber Craft Mead, along with your choice of four fun books picked out by Ricky the Mead Maker himself. And finally, there's the ultimate Father's Day gift box that has everything from the previous box and trades a bottle of the Old Fashioned Mead for the Drocky. That includes uh, free shipping, by the way, that one. Each of the boxes includes a handwritten Mead Dad message card, and you can outfit your dad with Groenfell Mead Dad Society apparel. Set dad up right this year with honey-based deliciousness from Groenfell.com, or drop some strong hints for somebody else to get you some good stuff. Check it all out at family-owned and operated Groenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. -N -N okay. Just when you thought all of the possible variations of IPA had been exhausted, here comes another one. <laughs> Truthfully, I, you know, I think if they're all delicious, bring them on. Let's talk to Matt Giovanisi of Brew Cabin and build a recipe for a cold IPA. Matt Giovanisi, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me again. We're going to taste some beers and then we're going to talk about uh, how mm -hmm. to make, make some beers, or a beer. <laughs> First of all, I have to apologize for uh, trying to kill you uh, through, the <laughs> through the shipping service. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, uh, I sent you this, this Pond Hopper uh, Golden Ale, 
And then mm. I said, well, I've got this uh, Blackberry, you know, cream ale. I, I'll send you some bottles of that, too. And I took I bottled sure. them all up and I took them to the UPS store and I sent them off. And then later that afternoon, I thought, oh, that cream ale's got unfermented blackberry juice in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I, I got the box delivered. And thankfully, that week, for some weird reason, was extra cold, like oh. outside. The weather was just like ridiculously cold. Oh. Um, so that was good. And then I took the bottle. I took the box. They delivered it. I brought it all the way out to the middle of my driveway. I put on gloves, <laughs> eye goggles, and I, I. It looked like I was, you know, diffusing a bomb. Um, and and, and everything is fine. Nothing happened, of course. Uh, but yeah, they were. That was a. Uh, it was interesting. Well, somebody could do the math. Uh, it, into five gallons or 19 liters of beer, I put two and a half cups or 600 milliliters of blackberry juice at 1033. So, yeah. So I, I did the math or I what I thought was the math. I don't know if it's right or not. But it only added like a point or two to the, you know, yeah, it didn't gravity seem like a lot of sugar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like, ah, it's probably okay. Um, so and it was. So, but but was there any fruit flavor left in the in the beer by the time it went and went through the mail and everything? Yeah, yeah. The first couple ones, um, the first one I opened, well, I opened one outside, warm, <laughs> just because I needed to know, and then I just drank it outside, um, warm, and it was very blackberry forward. Oh. Uh, the, the second one I had was really, really good. Cause I got it. I was able to chill it down. I was, I was chill and got to just sit there and, and enjoy it. And that was really good. And I opened one now and I do think it's been, I don't know what, two or three weeks since I got the box. Yeah. And I can smell it a little bit, but it's definitely faded. Yeah. I kegged it on, uh, June, February, March, April 21st. So it's been what a month, month and a few days. Yeah. So, uh, you yeah, know, put, in a bottle. In a bottle. That that from a keg fill. From a keg fill. So right. You know, had a chance to oxidize a little more than what I had here in the house. So, but I'm glad yeah. it didn't kill you. So. Uh... <laughs> no, it didn't kill me yet. I still have this last bottle. <laughs> Good and we're gonna and, and let's talk about your uh, the the pond hopper British. American Golden Ale that we formulated mm -hmm. on this show, uh, mm -hmm. I think last time we got together, uh, it was, it, we came out with the 6 pounds or 2.7 kilograms of Maris Otter. That's the British side. 3 pounds mm -hmm. or 1.4 kilograms of two American Turo. That's obviously the American side. Uh, I, I added uh, half a pound or 227 uh, grams of table sugar, right. which is kind of a... A salute to uh, Peter Simons and, and uh, one of his books that I had been re referencing. Uh, one ounce or 28 grams of Fuggle at 60 minutes. One ounce uh, e or 28 grams each of Target and Amarillo at Flame Out. And then dry hopped uh, with uh, one ounce or 28 grams each of Target and Amarillo. Um it started out at 1045, final gravity 1006, which is a little drier than my beers usually come out to, for an ABV of 5.1%. Mm. And Imperial A01 House is right. what we used. Um, so, so it, it so, came out to 5%? Yeah. Wow. So what So what do you think? Um, so that there's a lot of hop aroma, oh. which I didn't I, I – did, did you tell me or did – you were kind of worried about that? Or is it my dream in that? Well, I didn't know if it was going to be enough. The, the enough, right. I think, the amount of hops that we because we only did you know uh, two ounces at Flame Out, one each of the Target and Amarillo, right. and then that same amount dry hopped. Um, yeah, but there's certainly enough bitterness. Oh yeah, it's it's not like overly bitter, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'm surprised by how bitter it is actually, and I'm surprised that it hit five. Yeah. So it dried out pretty pretty well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but you got get a lot of bitterness in it. My my nose doesn't work as well as it used to. So, but you uh, but you are getting uh, a nice amount of uh, 
an, or an oh, adequate yeah. amount of hop aroma? Absolutely. Oh, nice. Yeah. And the, the hops uh, tend to, the flavor of the hops uh, that Target and Amarillo uh, seem to blend well together. Yeah, it's got a um, an old school, I shouldn't say old school, <laughs> but, you know, a classic hop flavor. I guess that's from the Target. Yeah, I, th- um, I think that Target is was like citrusy and maybe sage, I think maybe it was one yeah, of the descriptors. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah, that's exactly what I'm getting. Yeah, sage for sure. Definitely more herbal uh, than than fruity. And then whatever the Amarillo's adding is, you know, it's kind of got like a pithy, a pithy citrus peel. Right. But the pithy part. Like a grapefruit. Um, like a great pith. Yeah. yeah. But the white, you know, the white part of the skin. Right, right. Yeah. In the olden days when, when Amarillo first came out, it was mm-hmm. like super, I mean, uh, Andy Sparks made a, a, a beer with a ton of, of fresh Amarillo hops and it was just like exactly like drinking grapefruit juice. Um, oh yeah. I've, I've heard orange as the descriptor, but I've never got that from well, Amarillo. I think, I think it's, I think it's changed over time. I mean, maybe yeah, it, I agree. Maybe it's just me, but I think it's it's not Amarillo. I used to make these Amarillo ales, and the Amarillo used to be a yeah. lot more uh, powerful and fruity mm-hmm. to to my palate. Um, maybe I'm just maybe I've just gotten used to it over time. Uh, no, it, I've heard that exact same thing from other brewers hmm. about Amarillo. Yeah. Now, what what do you think about the the body of the beer? Do you think that adding that half a pound of table sugar was a positive thing or a negative thing or a neutral? Uh, I'd say neutral. I mean, not really familiar with the style besides that one example that I drank many years ago, but I definitely get the, the maltiness of the pale. I mean, like you can taste the Maris Otter in this for sure. Um, the sugar, I, you could have done without it, and I think it just would have been a lower ABV beer. Mm-hmm. But maybe, maybe adding that sugar balanced out the hop profile. You know, maybe it would have been too bitter had you not, you know, increased the alcohol by almost. I mean, according to what I have on the screen here, that beer should have came out at four point two percent, and you got five percent. So Oops. it's almost <laughs> a full, per, yeah, almost a full percentage more. Maybe that was. Maybe that adds to the, you know, it's obviously going to add to the body and the sweetness and maybe balancing out the hops a little bit more. So I, I'm, so I'll say, yeah, I think it was a good thing you did it. I think I think it made it more crisp uh, and mm-hmm. and it sharpens up the uh, the hop bitterness. Maybe it makes a, it a brighter beer, I think. Yeah, um, I, I kind of like it. Um, yeah, especially for a, like a summertime beer. Did you keg it or did you bottle condition these? Uh, I kegged, and then I sent you so a, is, a keg fill. Oh, this is a keg fill. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely get the graininess of the Maris Otter. It's there. Yeah, it's very good. It's a very summery beer for sure. Yeah, and the and which the, and the sugar didn't didn't make it like cidery at all. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, there's no twang at all. <laughs> Has a little whang to it. <laughs> I think it's a yeah. success. I uh, I don't know yeah. that I would. Would you Would you tweak this beer in in any way? Yeah, yeah. I'd probably, but only the hot profile. Mm. You know, maybe do something a little more. You know, like you mentioned Amarillo earlier about how it's changed. I probably would have kept. Yeah, I obviously like, you know, I've never really messed with Target too much, but I maybe, you know, going for a lower alpha acid English hop, like an EKG or even just more Fuggle instead of Target, Hmm. uh, just to get that sort of, you know, you know, I guess classic British hop note and then go with like uh, maybe a more, uh, I'm trying to think of maybe like a Simcoe. Oh. You know, instead of the Amarillo. Yeah. Just to kind of play up that the more citrusy note um, to balance that herbal note a little bit. Yeah. But that's I mean, I wouldn't change. I mean, I'm I, I usually you know, this is kind of just me being a hophead, I guess. But I probably would have upped the 
dry hopping and possibly the late edition hops a l- by like one ounce uh, just to get more hit <laughs> more in your, in your face kind of a thing yeah just more like aroma i guess i'm not really concerned i mean uh bitterness wise r- i kind of feel like it's right on the money i wouldn't change that i would just maybe add more aroma and uh from from uh, i guess like a a, a more i'll say um a hop that inspires more confidence in its use. <laughs> I could have probably, I could, probably could have said that shorter, but that's where I came. That's where I landed. <laughs> An old standby, or maybe a An new old standby. standby. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, well, I think I think it's a good beer. I think it, it, at least it's a it's a really strong starting point, if nothing else. Um. You know. I'm getting a lot of tea vibes too, so that's a good thing. Ooh, interesting. I think for for it being like an English beer, like an astringency kind of a thing. No, no, no. Like a like a black tea, uh, Earl Grey vibes, but huh. not in an astringent note. Just in a you know like a like perfectly steeped Earl Grey. I can see that. You can talk me into that. Maybe that's that that mm. saginess or whatever of the of the target. Yeah, I, 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 no, it's a good beer. Yeah, I could talk. I, I could talk. Uh, I could be talked into that for sure. A couple of weeks ago, Susan and I went to Tulsa to see They Might Be Giants. What an amazing show! We we'd had tickets. We bought the tickets for that before the pandemic, but <laughs> the show was rescheduled twice. Anyway, uh, before the show, we went to Pippin's Tap Room at High Gravity in Tulsa. We got to chat with Desiree and Dave in person and try some of the delicious beers that they have on tap there. You know, one of the benefits of having a tap room at your homebrew shop is that you can develop recipes, try them out on your patrons, get them just right, and then make homebrew kits out of them. If you go to the newly redesigned highgravitybrew.com, you can find kits like Desiree Cream Ale, which I brewed and added blackberry juice to. That was way good. The Summer Blonde. The Summerzeit Kolsch and the Pineapple Express Session New England IPA. All those sound great for summertime sipping. Or, if you want to be creative, you can use the new and improved Build Your Own Beer page to put together your own recipe. I've done that, too. You know, I, I, I like the new version of the Build Your Own Beer page even better than the old one. And I really like the old one. And, of course... While you're on the new and improved HighGravityBrew.com, you can check out the Warthog Electric Systems and Controllers designed to take the pain out of propane. Use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your Warthog purchase. Desiree tells me y'all are good customers, and, and they hear all the time that we sent you their way. So I'm grateful to you for supporting those who support us. Head over to family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. So we want to. So what? It's your turn to brew. Yeah. What? Uh, what direction you want to go? What do you want to brew? Well, um, I have a lot to brew this year uh, because in September I'm getting married at my house, and I'm going to be making all the beer for the wedding, and. I have a lot to, yeah, so I have a lot to brew. And so I've been trying to slowly come up with ideas and I've talked to some people and, um, uh, you know, I, I have some ingredients here for a Mexican lager that I want to do, but I want to dry hop it aggressively with uh, Mochueca because apparently it gives a lime character to it. Um, and I'm just in, I'm back in, you know, like I took a break from making really hoppy beers for like maybe the entire winter. Uh, and I was just kind of sticking to darker beers and, and more classic English. I did a lot of uh, dark milds when we were doing that episode. And I don't know, it's starting to get nice out. And I'm like, ah, I really want I want hops again. I'm feeling the hops. Yeah. So, yeah, I recently uh, brewed two New England IPAs that I'm just like, all right, I have all these hops in the freezer. I'm trying to, like, get through them so that, you know, we make room for the uh, for the fall harvest. And um I, I, th- one of the beers that I wanted to make, cause I, I made one, I, I'll say I made something similar, um, back last year. So my fiance cannot drink beer, uh, because of a gluten intolerance. Mm. And so 
we had a theory that maybe I could make a beer that was just so low in gluten that it almost didn't exist, right? Yeah. And that was sort of the idea. And I was like, well, how would I go about doing that with without making a gluten-free beer, essentially? And I decided, okay, well, remember Brute IPA? Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll do something like that where I'll just dry it out. I'll, I'll dry it out. I'll add clarity firm to kind of reduce – um, you know, the, 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 the gluten in the beer mm -hmm. and I'll use a substantial adjunct like corn or rice instead of like a hundred percent barley. And I'll just dry hop it like crazy to make a super hoppy beer. And so I made a beer called, I called it gluteus minimus <laughs> and, uh, and that beer was, I believe it was like, it was a rice it was rice and, and, and uh, like, you know, a two row or a Pilsner malt. And uh, I used uh, a, um, what do you call it? Like an enzyme to break it down to dry it out. Mm -hmm. I used Clarity Firm. I, and I dry hopped it with, I believe it was Mochueca and another New, e New, New Zealand hop that I had. It might have been Nelson or Galaxy or something like that. And the beer came out crystal clear and super hoppy and she probably had one glass and then i just just, just like killed the keg like i just <laughs> i i thought it was like so good so um, did it make her sick or no she... it did not oh good but i think she was just overly cautious like all right yeah it's uh something <laughs> you know but i think at the end but, of the day she was like no but it didn't it didn't cause her any distress as she it did not cause her any distress no well that's good yeah so i'm not going to sit here and claim that uh <laughs> whatever i made was gluten free but it you know i i did all the i felt like i did all the necessary steps to make it as low gluten as humanly possible yeah um so i kind of wanted to repeat something in that uh, idea and I was kind of going off brute IPA you know but then cold IPA was a thing and then I'm like well maybe I'm making cold IPA <laughs> right so I don't know but I, I read you know I read this um, article in one of the brewing magazines about cold IPA from the guy who invented cold IPA uh, at Wayfinder and uh, you know one of the things that he said was it's it's a tr if you don't know about a hop, right? If you're like trying to think about, oh, like what does this hop taste like? You think, oh, I'm going to make an 100% Galaxy New England IPA, and that's going to, you know, teach me about the flavors of this hop. Right. But he was like, you know, the malt and the sugar in in those in those New England IPAs are getting in the way of that hop flavor, and they're kind of competing with one another. And so if you go with something where the malt profile is sort of moved out of the way so that you can really experience the true flavor of the hop, then that's what a cold IPA is. And I'm like, I love that idea. I, you know, and it makes a lot of sense that, okay, if you really want to understand a single, a single hop flavor and how to use it, make a cold IPA essentially. Uh, is it, is it cold? What, what makes it a cold IPA? Is it just, is it basically an IPL? Uh, you know, is it, is it lagered? Yeah. Uh, no, it's <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's the first thing I, when I, when it first came out, I was one of those people, you know, I saw the can. I'm like, really? What? Really? Come on. That's an IPL, right? It's a lager. <laughs> um, no, it's not because it's not made with any caramel malts or crystal malts and it's not fermented. <sighs> so that the idea is that you take, you, you want to clean fermentation, but they either do a lager yeast fermented warm or an ale yeast fermented cold. Uh, hmm. So you can make the choice. And, and I'm like, all right. So I guess that's kind of what makes it different. O obviously, like it's highly adjunct. So what, what I did with the rice in my, you know, gluteus minimus beer was I was trying to just reduce the amount of available gluten in the beer to begin with by adding an adjunct like rice or corn. And I decided to go with uh, rice because I just felt it was a cleaner adjunct than corn is. Mm -hmm. um, so I so so that's apparently what you know, it's like you're you're mo you're moving away from the 
malt flavor and adjuncting it with something other than like a flaked wheat or oat, like a high protein malt or a high protein, you know, adjunct. So no, apparently it's not an IPL. It's, it's something different. Although I don't know why it's called cold. <laughs> that, that, that part was still not, uh, that would be... you know, I know why it's called IPA cause it sells beers, but uh, <laughs> I don't know why specifically cold. Huh? Interesting. Yeah. Huh? Because again, you ferment it, you ferment it hot. If, if you have a lot, if you use a lager, you're just supposed to ferment it warm. And I'm like, well, then it's a warm IPA. But no one wants to drink something called a warm IPA. <laughs> we run out of we've just run out of adjectives for IPAs, and so <laughs> yeah, I, I I loved brute IPA when it was out. I I, I really like that style. I have to brew a bunch of beers for the wedding, and I like to come up with names that are based on my favorite TV shows or favorite movies or lines and things, you know, or even song lyrics, but. Someone in our friend group had the idea, or maybe it was even Steph who had the idea that was like, well, what if all the beers for the wedding were named after like wedding themed beers, but like, um, but as jokes. So one of the jokes that I came up with was, what if I called a beer cold feet (laughs) and you were drinking it at the wedding? And then my friend was like, well, then that has to be a cold IPA, right? I'm like, well, of course it, I guess it does. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and so that's where I was like, all right, well, I want to make a cold IPA called Cold Feet. And uh, um, I also ha- I'm sitting on a bunch of ingredients that I'm, I want to play around with. And I sort of wanted to just throw out what I have and decided, like, should we try that? Should we experiment with that or should we pull back and do it more traditional? Because I do have two recipes in this uh, magazine that are, quote unquote, traditional cold IPAs. But we could also throw in some crazy fun ingredients that I that I have lying around and see what happens. Yeah, gee, gee I wonder which way I'll want to go. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's why I want to leave the. I want to. I want to kind of like open this up to. I mean, I, I have a homebrew store, so I can get whatever. Right. But also, I have a bunch of ingredients that I'm like, I kind of have to use them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's get started. Let's uh, let's start. Okay. Let's start with the grain bill. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm assuming, and, and I looked, which is the easiest part. Yeah. Well, yeah. With a, with a hoppy beer. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, I looked through my notes. Uh, you know, because you you talked about wanting to do a hoppy beer, and it's like, oh, let's look through my brewer's logbooks from the past few years and see, you know, what hoppy beers I've brewed, and and I was like, oh, there's a bunch of them, a bunch of these IPAs, and like. Uh, almost all of them were based on the uh, Bell's Two Hearted clone recipe, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not much help. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm the guy who goes to a restaurant and once he, you know, once I find a, a, a dish that I like, I, that's it. I might, the restaurant might as well be called, you know, Kung Pao Chicken Place. You know, or, uh, yeah, I hear you. I hear you because I <laughs> once I find something I like, I stick with it. Um, Sure. So, so what? What's our base grain? What do you want to start out with? Uh, so, I definitely want to start out with Pilsner malt as our base grain. Mm-hmm. Um, I I happen to have a lot of it, and I this beer when I when I think back to the original beer that I'd made, it was just that it looked like you know like a Bud Light color, you know, or maybe even a what's where regular Budweiser, you know, <laughs> where it was just that like pure crystal clear golden straw color mm-hmm. you know and it's like and and not that it's an american light lager although i guess it kind of, well this beer because it's an ipa um and according to the to the recipes and the um inventor uh it should be high in alcohol to balance out all of the hops that you're throwing at it mm. um so i'm thinking we just do pilsner malt and flaked rice Oh, okay. So it's basically it's basically the Budweiser grain bill, <laughs> as I understand it. <laughs> Pilsner malt, yeah. Pilsner malt and rice. Yep. So in order, so I'm going to be using my single vessel brew system from SS, and and um, that means I need to use and again according to the to the, to the recipes, roughly thirty to forty percent rice. You know, so very highly adjunct. Whoa. Um, so I, I have in here 11 pounds of Pilsner malt at 68, 69 percent. 
uh, and then flaked r- five pounds of flaked rice at 30 percent. Wow. Okay. And that gives me an ABV of 7.1. And that's going to you would think that that would be pretty dry. Yeah. And depending on the, you know, the yeast we use and how we f- choose to ferment it. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd want to dry it out now. Yeah. So that's that's pretty much it. I don't think I, w- I would go any crazier than that. Um, I think the crazier things are going to be in like the yeast and the hops. And I have some uh, other fun ingredients we could talk about. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, also for the mash profile, I'm just going to mash as low as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, probably go with. Uh, what do I have here? I have a Kolsch that I usually do at 145. So I'll just use that. Oh, wow. Um, and. Yeah, we'll just yeah. So I'll mash low to kind of dry, keep it as dry as possible. Right. I was thinking I would do a longer boil because the last um, lager that I made, which I did ferment warm, um, I had but like as it was going in the fermenter, I just smelled that like creamed corn oh. smell. And you know what? Every the, I even had another batch. Where going in the fermenter, I used Pilsner malt, same deal. And I'm like, what? It Like, I must not be boiling this Pilsner malt long enough. Um, so I, I think I was, I would like to do a longer boil for sure. Yeah, if you've had issues with it in the past. I mean, typically, um, are you, so who's, is it an American Pilsner malt? I, I've forgotten already. <laughs> I'm, no, I so I ha, I have a uh, <laughs> I have a bo- oh, wait, well, uh, Belgian pills. Ah, well, maybe you know because I, I I don't know. I, we had a conversation with Doug Hurst of uh, Metropolitan Brewing uh, when mm-hmm. we were in Chicago, and you know they're a lager brewery, uh, and he was talking about one of his malt providers in the past. Uh, he brewed, you know a Pilsner beer or, or brewed, you know, light beer with it, light colored beer. And it came out, mm. you know, corny or came out, you know, with, with, he had a problem with DMS, uh, but it was yeah. just that, you know, so then he switched manufacturers and, you know, didn't have the problem after that. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I just noticed that this, I, I noticed it when I did the, the, I did, I did a, uh, what do you call it? I think I just cloned our um, Italian pills. Oh yeah. And, the I used the I, I put the lid on after I boiled to whirlpool, uh, and I was like, oh, that did it, you know. And then, but have. then I made another. I made a a white peach wheat beer that had it in there, and then I I purposely left the lid off this time and didn't even whirlpool for that long. And I'm like, oh, I still smell a little bit. So huh. yeah, but that one had a DMS smell. So I think I would just like to boil a little bit longer on this one, and yeah, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Very exciting news from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Yeast about their next featured hybrid yeast strain. It's called I-10 Mangostini. Evident Imperial says our brewing scientists developed this new Saccharomyces cerevisiae strain by directing two unique strains through their idle sexual cycle via fungal sporulation, isolating resulting in a hybrid that is an efficient and highly flavorful agent for fermentation. All that fancy uh, talk just, just says that they they guided these uh, normally uh, asexual uh, budding yeast strains into combining their, their DNA, so to speak. You, you remember Matt Winans, Dr. Matt Winans, talking to us about this last year, uh, this hybridization process. Uh, Mangostini was developed for its excellent attenuation, prompt reduction of diacetyl, and versatility brewing a wide variety of ales and IPAs. It boasts a robust flavor profile of ripe tropical fruit, strawberry, and lychee, or is it lychee, that beautifully complements big hop additions. I think I know what my next beer is going to be. I-10 Mangostini is now shipping... Uh, or it's a, it, you can order it now with shipping starting next week. And it's, it's worth noting that this strain is not a GMO product, Evan says. I'm very excited to get my hands on I-10 Mangostini. 
uh, to brew at least one deliciously hoppy beer for the summer. Ask your local homebrew store to stock up on I-10 Mangostini from Imperial and check out all the fun and deliciously dependable strains on imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. But what, uh, so so talk about hops. Is it time to talk about hops? So I'm going to look into my inventory, but again, we don't have to stick to this. Um, I have kind of a smattering of different hops, but I have a lot of cryo hops. Ooh. Um, I have a lot of Citra from this past year, from 2022. I have some Citra cryo. I have some... Mosaic cryo. I have some Sabro cryo. I have um, I have mosaic pellets. I have citra pellets. So I kind of feel like I'm, I'm I'm kind of already there a little bit. I have uh, <laughs> I have Columbus. If we wanted to do some bittering, the cryo hops uh, for those who may not be f- be familiar is kind of a concentrated hop product, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if you were going to use two hot, two ounces in the dry hop of regular T90 pellets, uh, you should use only one ounce of the uh, cryo hops, which, you know, I've used very infrequently, but I've, I did it in a hop water recipe, and I can tell you that that stuff never left the water. Like, it just, because it's such a fine yellow, it's like, almost like it's like, it just concentrates all that like yellow lupulin powder mm-hmm. in the hop. Mm-hmm. And I kind of felt like, you know, it's great for an I, you know, an IPA or a great for like a new England IPA, but man, that stuff just like stays in suspension long. You know, it took, a, it took many weeks for that to like drop out of pure water. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know how good it would be for a, a you know, a beer that you want to sort of, I, or at least I want it to be crystal clear um, or homebrew clear. So I don't know. It may be worth, it may be worth trying. What, what hop are, or, or maybe a couple of hops that you're like, I would, you know, maybe you've had a commercial example, or maybe you're like, I kind of wanted to use this at one point, but just haven't, you know, had the opportunity to use it. Is there any, does anything come to mind or no? Citra, I remember as being a tasty one, uh, nice yeah. and lemony. I would not be opposed to doing a hundred percent citra. Ooh, because I love that. I mean, obviously that's a that's the we talk about you know an old standby. That's a that's a new standby. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 like like your your author said, if you want to explore that hop, um, mm. actually, the more I more we I think about it, the more. I think that's that would be a fun thing to do just a single hop and just see how it uh, how it comes see how out it plays out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. All right. So uh all right. So I you know, when I make New England IPAs, um I tend to, just for the sake of ease, I just do a huge, huge charge of hops at the uh, whirlpool stage. And what I'll usually do is I'll throw in normally six ounces, which a lot of hops right at flame out and then let the kettle spin for 30, like 20 or 15, but between 15 and 30 minutes, which usually drops it to about 170 degrees Fahrenheit uh, over the course of, you know, that 30 minutes. That's usually what I do, and I kind of feel like, especially for the New England IPAs, it gives me plenty of bitterness. And only a handful of times have I gone, oh, you know, maybe I'll add like a quarter ounce or a half ounce of some kind of like, you know, bittering hop, you know, at 60 minutes. But um, I don't know, you know, this beer I think could go, it could definitely, you know, withstand any IBU punch we give it if we wanted to, if we wanted to give it an early kick of, of Citra, even maybe just like a quarter ounce and then the rest of it, just throw in the dry or in the hot side whirlpool. Yeah. It's and kind then of obviously an insurance it, policy kind of. Yeah, exactly. So you think we should do that? Sure. All right. Um, I'll add, let me see. Cause this, what I, I have a, my, 
My particular Citra is 13.2% alpha acid. Mm. Um, so I'll start with 0.25 ounces. That's, yeah, I'll do a first wart hopping. Why not? I kind of always do that. Yeah, that gives us a decent, that gives us, that would, you know, between that and six ounces at uh, flame out, that would be about 49 IPUs, which, you know, I don't, you definitely get more IBUs in that, uh, more than that, I think. But that's kind of right in the middle. Yeah. I think that's pretty good. And then uh, I'll I'll dry hop with only three ounces of the cryo stuff. How does that sound? Well, that, that, if it's twice as strong, that should be plenty. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a hop monster for sure. Yeah. Um, but I figured, hey, the more hops we could throw at it, I guess the more you're going to taste the hops. <laughs> and this is, so this is usually my, like my standard new England IPA recipes are, are 12 ounces of hops total. I do six, a big charge of six ounces at the uh, whirlpool and then six ounce dry hop, or sometimes more if I just have extra and I just throw it all in and it's hoppy. I mean, meaning aroma wise. Yeah. So we have, um, yeah, hundred percent citra. And we're going to be quite a lot of citra. Uh, we're going to, well, you know, equivalent to about 12 ounces. But since we're using the uh, the cryo version, it'll only be about nine and a half ounces. And that'll give us, uh, or sorry, nine and a quarter ounce. And that'll give us a lot more yield as far as the end product because we're not adding as much, you know, vegetal matter. And that's right. soaking up all the warp. So um, the only other thing we got to talk about is fermentation so like the the article says you can kind of go two ways you can do a lager yeast warm you ferment a lager yeast warm or ferment an ale yeast cold and they said if you're going to do that obviously uh, a cold yeast is a good ale yeast that you can ferment cold mm. or you know do a classic lager yeast like a you know just a really clean simple lager yeast that we can ferment uh, they tell you to st – in both recipes that I saw, and, and I've never done this before, you pitch at 55 degrees Fahrenheit and then just let it free rise with no temperature control. Right. Huh. Uh, you know, and it, it'll go – you know, and it'll just let it rise all the way up. It gives you that natural, natural like, diacetyl rest. And something else they mentioned, which I thought was super fascinating, is this idea – you know the idea of hop creep in mm -hmm. a beer? Yeah. So um, they they encourage that, which a lot of homebrewers try to, you know. So that would I dry guess. the beer out even more. Correct. Right. Hop creep is, is essentially the enzymes that are, are I think enzymes in the hops that actually yep. continue the, the conver conversion of starches into sugar. And then the right. yeast gets to eat that sugar as well. Yep. Yep. Um. So I so if we do the the warm version, that'll happen. If we do it cold, then which, again, I don't know why it's called cold IPA when they're saying. <laughs> uh, well, know, it, it seems like to me that it would be less tricky to do to ferment the lager yeast warmer, yeah, than to do the ale yeast colder, because yeah. the lager so yeast is going to work in the warm temperature. Yeah. Uh, the ale yeast, maybe not so much in the colder temperature. Right. And and you're starting it at 55, so you're starting it at lager temps. Right. And then you're it, just kind of – and that's the beginning part is where, really where you need to worry, right? And, and Yeah. And if you're – if I know you, you're going to pitch a lot of yeast <laughs> 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 at, yeah. at the, at, in the beginning. So uh -huh. it's probably going to get to work straight away. Yeah. Uh, so it's going to – probably going to do – you know, a lot of that fermentation work right there in the very beginning when it, you know, starts out cold. Yeah. Yeah. So I really like that because it's very hands off. It's very like, you know, all I got to do is get it down to 55, which will be challenging. But uh, once I have it there, then I can pitch the yeast. Yes, I will pitch. Uh, maybe I won't pitch a, a lot this time. <laughs> I've been I mean, I've just been because, you know, it's it's so funny. I use Imperial a lot and. I never I always just pitch it straight, even if the packet's like six months to like eight months old, it still works. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never had an issue. 
And just that one time, I was like, well, I'm making a pretty high gravity beer. Let me just uh, double up. And I, I, di- I definitely did not need to do that. But, <laughs> uh, and I do this, I, you know, and I, I, I do it for loggers too. But um, yeah, I think, I guess as far as like lager yeast are concerned, I kind of feel like I, I am not an expert in lager yeast. I don't brew many lagers. Um, do you have a favorite? I don't brew up until this year. Yeah. <laughs> I I haven't brewed many, you know, a lot of lagers. Uh but then but then uh, uh Imperial featured a couple of lager yeasts in a row. I think the K Bueno was the uh the most recent one. Uh and then the Huga which I've been oh, told I can't, yeah. I haven't uh, I don't pronounce it right. But the No, but, it's a uh, um Huge. Hugh, Hugh, Hugh. Yeah, it, 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 um, we say it all the time because, you know, we ha- we're Steph's uh, of Norwegian descent. Oh. And uh, our cat is Norwegian. And um, and our friends live in Norway and just very into that. Like, uh, our, we try to decorate our house in that Hugay vibe. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Well, there, there may be some, uh, some Que Bueno left <laughs> at your homebrew store. I have a packet of it. Oh, well, there you go. And I, uh, you know, I was gonna use it for a Mexican lager. Well, it's but, it's just a nice, clean fermenting yeast, you know. So I I used it for uh, oh my <laughs> my Hellesbach, and then my oh, yeah. my yeah. wrong ingredients Hellesbach. Uh, yeah, and they both you know big beers. Uh, mm-hmm. I did use a starter, uh, but uh, you know the, it went to work straight away and got the job done. Very clean fermenting. So yeah, if you already got that on hand, I'd say yeah, I have to get another. I mean, I wanted to use it. I'll 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 get another packet because I wanted to use it for the Mexican lager. But I think I forgot how I got that. But anyway, yeah, we can use that. So go over the hopping strategy one more time. We're putting a quarter right. quarter ounce at at uh, sixty or ninety minutes, I guess, since you're boiling longer. Sure. Yep. Um. So it'll yeah, it'll be a quarter ounce of Citra regular pellet. For, I do a first wort hop because I kind of feel like why not, right? Mm-hmm. It's like it helps the boil over and and adds a little bit softer bitterness. I'll take it. And then I'm going to boil it for 90 minutes. And then as soon as I turn off the, the heat, I'm going to add six ounces of regular citra, T90 citra. And I'm just going to spin. I have a, you know, the, the single vessel thing has a whirlpool thing. So I, I'll I'll pump it through there. And spin it for 30 minutes, lid off, and let it kind of naturally come down in temperature from, I guess for me, it's only 202 degrees is my boiling temp, mm-hmm. roughly, 201 degrees, I think. Um, and I'll let that naturally come down to one, usually ca- usually bottoms out at like 170 at the end. And I'll do that for 30 minutes, just because usually I'll do 15 to 20 minutes for my New Englands, but for this one, I kind of want more bitterness. So I'll I'll extend it to 30 minutes and then uh, drop the temperature to as low as I can get it with my groundwater temp and then uh, put it in the fermenter and and try to get it down to 55 degrees. I can get it down. I'll get it down to 55 degrees and I will pitch. Oh, oh, OK. What we could do, which I've never done before, but it was it one of the recipes in here talked about it and I've seen it talked about. So little that I had to like wrap my head around what it is. Have you ever heard of dip hopping? Uh, yes, but I can't remember what it was. Yeah. All right. So I, I literally had to look it up because I'm like, I saw it as a, as a, oh, dip hop, you know, dip hop. I was like, all right, dip hop. Um, <laughs> apparently what you do is you, t- you take some of the wort before it's hopped and you cool it down to 170. So you take a quart of wort, by the way, mm-hmm. not, to, not to intentionally rhyme, but that's what it is. <laughs> uh, quart of wort, and you put your your you put your I'll call them dry hops for that for this matter, um, or your dip hops in in that quart at 170, and then you put that in your fermenter. So just one quart in your fermenter, close it up. When you're done your boil, then you just add it to the um, you know, you add the rest of the fermenter. And so those hops have already been kind of steeping 
in that 170, you know, it's going to be, it's going to drop temperature pretty fast. Right. And it's, so you're, you're kind of like adding the dry hops immediately, which is another thing that I think we should do. We might as well take advantage of the bio transformation and, and, um, if that helps dry out the beer a little bit more, mm-hmm. I think that's the move. Cause I've also never done that before. I usually like to wait until the fermentation is complete before adding dry hops because I like to reuse the yeast. I like to harvest this, but this, this time I think, I think it's worth, um, you know, trying some crazy technique as opposed to crazy ingredients maybe. So it's kind of like a hop tea made with unfermented wort. Yes. Huh. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. I, I've seen other people use just water to do it. I I, I kind of like the idea of the, the wort. Instead of the, you know, you're not diluting your product. Right. And I wonder though, are you, you know, and I'll have to, I guess this is something we can decide. Do we want pre hopped wort or unhopped wort? Which I guess it will be hopped anyway. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But uh, like, or I guess like un isomerized acid wort, wort. Oh. Does that make sense? I don't think with that with that low of a bitterness level, I don't think I don't know that it would. I don't think it matters, right? Matter that much? No. Yeah, I just don't know when to pull that court. Yeah, and if you're worried about uh, like you know DMS, maybe you pull it at the at the end of the boil at the end. Before, before the before the the yeah the the big load of whirlpool hops. Yeah, and so let and you're right it it will it will cool down a lot quickly more quickly than you know, the rest of it that's in the, in the kettle during right. the whirlpool. So you'll get a different effect. Yeah. I think it's worth trying. Yeah. I mean, it sounds easy. I have a, I have a quart dipper. I could just dip it in to the wort, dump it in my fermenter, which will probably help sanitize a little bit. Um, that'll probably, and it'll probably cool it down to 170 pretty fast if I do that. Mm-hmm. And then just add those cryo hops in and then, you know, pipe the rest of the wort on top of that. And then that's it. I don't have to really worry about temperature control or dry hopping schedule. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like it. Yeah, it sounds yeah. Uh, sounds fairly uh, carefree. As far yeah, as... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like brewing with me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no hey. temperature control. No. There you go. <laughs> well, you have some. You have to when you do loggers. You have yeah, to. Yeah, I've right? got my kegerator. Get your kegerator. Yeah. Well, yeah, is, that, so... is that it? That's just uh, yeah. That's it. Wow. I think it's going to be good. Yeah, and what I'll do is I will keg it. And, oh, the, I keep forgetting. I have other things. The other thing I could try is I do have an enzyme. Oh. And that well, could dry it out even more. I mean, I could just throw it in. What's the What's the uh, software predict, you know, with all that rice? What's the software predict the, the violent gravity is going to be? So I'm, I've been looking at this. I don't think it's right because I've also increased the boil time to 90 minutes and the mash profile to 90 minutes. It says it's going to uh, – and I put the K Bueno in there. It says one, uh, 1017. What? Which is pretty high. And yeah, what's, your, what's your original gravity? Uh, 1070. Still. Yeah. I think it's going to be lower than that. I think it's going to be way lower than that. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah. And and when I change the uh, the and maybe I have to just I don't know. Maybe I just let me just refresh the screen. Maybe it'll change. Um, but when I added the 90 minutes and I didn't increase the uh, I didn't increase the fermentables at all. I'm like, well, that's going to concentrate the fermentables. Mm-hmm. You know, so that yeah. and it didn't go up at all. But oh. anyway, mm. um, but yeah, I guess, but I also increased the sack rest. So I don't know, may, I don't know. No, it should have done, it should have increased it, but it hasn't. So yeah, it's saying 1017, but I just don't see that being the case. No. So because of that, I think it's worth throwing in the, uh, the enzyme. Sure. All right, you know, I have it. And the other thing too, I didn't do any um, water profile stuff but uh i be- since i'm trying to essentially make a um a pilsner style or like a i guess a budweiser style uh i'm just gonna go with like a normal you know soft pilsner profile yeah so that should should be a dry beer should be clear should be incredibly hoppy and what i will do is i will 
keg this beer, let it condition and clear out. Um, should happen. I'll tell you what, the, the, when I did that gluteus minimus beer, that thing cleared so fast. I was shocked, mm. uh, which was nice. Cause it's like, I've never, <laughs> it's like, you know, home brews, it takes a long time if you don't use any, you know, crazy findings for them to really clear out. Right. And man, this was like clear, like with, after a couple of days, it was, it was wow. nice. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm hoping I can get that, you know, maybe I can add some clarity firm. I think, oh, that's right. I added clarity firm. Oh, yeah, that thing worked. <laughs> so I don't have any of that, but I could get it anyway. Uh, so I'm going to can it and send it to you. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and I might throw some other stuff in there as well. Yeah. And there's not, there's not a huge, not a huge hurry. Cause I mean, Steve and I are going to go to the con, uh, oh, yeah, Pittsburgh? in, uh, in, uh, San Diego. Oh, it's in San Diego. Yes. Pittsburgh last year? Yes. Uh, last year. Okay. Yeah. San Diego for the third time at the mm. town and country, uh, place resort. Uh, really looking forward to that. And hopefully we'll when have, is that? Uh, uh, third week in June. June 20 oh, okay. something. Wow, it's coming up. Yeah. And so hopefully we'll have a lot of content yep. from there. Uh, but we could sneak, you know, we could sneak in uh, an episode whenever we need to. We don't have to run everything all at the same time. Sure. But, uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, excellent. Keep me, you know, keep us posted on uh, on how the brew goes. Will do. And uh, we'll be watching the Instagram, the Brew Cabin Instagram. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know people can check out your brewcabin dot com for uh, uh, curriculum on mm-hmm. homebrewing, and your brew cabin YouTube channel uh, for uh, for fun videos. One of them, one of them featuring uh, me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just a pretty pretty dang fun video. And of course, uh, if you've got a swing, you know it's it's pool it's pool time. <laughs> it's pool time. Or a hot, you got a pool or a hot tub, yeah. And you know, you want to know how to do it right. Look up swimuniversity.com and the swim university videos on the YouTube's as well. Yeah, we just published a book. A book. I just published a full, fully illustrated book. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah, the pool care handbook. Yeah. Wow. And you could find that yeah. at swimuniversity.com as well. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. First time I've. I've Wrote it many years ago, and then we rewrote it this past year, and I just finished illustrating it and getting it printed, and it's for sale. Wow. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If I had a pool, I would ask for a signed <laughs> copy. <laughs> I'm not going to do the hot tub one next. Do you have a hot tub? No. <laughs> Neither do I, ironically. It's like human soup. I don't <laughs> Yeah. That's a good name for a beer. On that note, <laughs> hop tub, <laughs> hop tub. There you go, yeah. hop tube. No, that's yeah. something else. Uh, all right, Matt G. Vanessi, this has been fun. Yep, as always. And uh, and keep us keep us posted, and and I look forward to tasting that beer. Will do. Thank you. Well, thanks again to Matt. Really looking forward to trying that beer and seeing what those uh, special hopping techniques bring to the table always something new to try if you have brewing questions show suggestions or just want to say howdy write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com and please don't forget to tell us where you're from check out our mobile friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com thanks to everybody supporting us through our patreon page special goodies coming your way check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing it's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long. Music.